Hi everyone, welcome back to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks for new ER nurses. Today, we will be going over rapid sequence intubation, so let's get to it. In this slide, I just wanted to give a brief outline of what our discussion will be today, right? So, what is it? What is a rapid sequence intubation? It's an advanced airway management technique where the patient is sedated and then paralyzed in order to quickly and safely intubate the trachea. In other words, you're knocking someone out to the point where they can't move and placing a tube inside their trachea so that we can breathe for them using a ventilator. The decision to intubate can at times be very easy to make, while at others, it can be very, very difficult. Let's talk about some of the reasons why when it's very clear that somebody needs to be intubated. One of the main reasons is that a patient is very altered to the point where they can't protect their own airway. Their GCS is eight or less, meaning if they were to vomit, they would just aspirate on that vomit, or perhaps the patient is altered enough to that if they're laying flat, their own tongue occludes their own airway. Another clear reason is when someone is in respiratory failure. The patient is struggling to breathe, working harder and harder. However, despite all of our non-invasive techniques, their oxygenation, work of breathing, and mentation does not improve. And you know that the patient will eventually tire out from how fast they are breathing and will go further and further into respiratory failure and ultimately into arrest if you do not intervene. Another clear reason can be an obvious airway obstruction, such as worsening epiglottitis, angioedema of the oral cavity with an allergic reaction, or even an abscess in the throat or behind or under the tongue, which can perhaps be from a tooth infection or from some, something else, but this obstruction is making it harder and harder for the patient to breathe. Another example can be a trauma patient with significant injuries who is altered and combative and is needing emergent CT scans. So they get intubated in order to be taken to CT to assess for further uh, damage internally, including an intracranial hemorrhage, which, which can be the cause for the altermentation. But on the other side of the coin, sometimes it's not so easy to decide to uh, intubate somebody, right? Are they going to perhaps get better and won't need to be intubated or are they going to keep getting worse? At times, it's not so easy to make that uh, decision, right? So it goes back to how long do you give non-invasive interventions like placing the patient on a non-rebreather or placing them on a BiPAP? How long do you give these interventions to work? to start to improve oxygenation or mentation before deciding to intubate. It's not always so clear cut, right? However, your job as an emergency nurse is going to be to closely monitor your patient, determining if these interventions being implemented are working or not, right? And if they're not communicating with the rest of the team in a timely manner. So you have to keep in mind that it is better to intubate somebody who you expect to decline early on, such as a patient with worsening epiglottitis and worsening um, shortness of breath, so that you and the team can prepare adequately for this intubation. And we're going to talk in future slides right now how it is that you prepare to intubate somebody so that you can do it safely without with minimizing the risk of complications. Because if you have to do a crash intubation, meaning you do it hurriedly without properly properly preparing, it increases the risk of uh, complications. And we're also going to talk about the complications that you should be watching out for. So I know, I know, I said that it can be very easy at times to, to intubate, but at other times it's not so clear cut. And just to summarize, your job is to closely monitor your patient and in a timely manner, communicating and collaborating with the rest of the team so that you can decide what's best for your patient. Now let's talk about preparing. And since I'm always preaching about being proactive and not reactive, you should already know what I am going to say. Your rooms need to be checked early on in your shifts for suction equipment, oxygen equipment and supplies, and ambu bags or bag valve masks because these are the essentials for any true emergency. On the next slide, we'll go over specific equipment needed, but 
the most important aspect of preparing for RSI is pre-oxygenation. Again, I'm going to repeat this. The most important aspect of preparing for rapid sequence intubation is pre-oxygenation, meaning we place the patient on oxygen, on high levels of oxygen, in order to build up the oxygen levels within the body so that while they are being intubated and not breathing, the body has a reserve of oxygen that it can use. So to do this, the gurney should have an oxygen tank. You attach a regular just nasal cannula to the oxygen tank on the gurney, crank it up to 15 and place it on the patient. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but we are trying to build up the oxygen, right? Then on top of the nasal cannula, you attach a non rebreather to the wall oxygen place it on the patient and crank it all the way up to 15. All of this, all of this high oxygen level, high oxygenation to build up the oxygen levels inside your patient. A side uh, topic is that if, that an ambu bag can be used instead of the non rebreather. But if the patient is taking their own spontaneous breaths, you simply hold the ambu bag, the mask, over their mouth and their nose without bagging or squeezing air into them. However, if the patient is not taking their own spontaneous breaths, then yes, you do a 3C tight seal and bag them every five seconds. You ideally want to pre-oxygenate a patient for at least two minutes. Again, I'm gonna re-say re this because it's also important. You ideally want to pre-oxygenate a patient for at least two minutes. As for patient positioning, you'll want to move them up in the bed of course, get help with anything heavy because you do not want to hurt yourself and place their head tilted back with the ears lining up at the sternal notch. If the patient is unstable, including blood pressure and SpO2, you're going to want to address it. If the BP is soft or in other words, it's low, a push dose presser may be used, meaning a small dose of epinephrine or phenylephrine will be given to bring the blood pressure up and simultaneously, if it's not contraindicated, fluids can also be given. All of this is done, including blood pressure management and pre-oxygenation to prevent the patient from arresting, since it's more likely for the patient who is already unstable with a low blood pressure, low SpO2, and already acidotic to arrest during intubation, especially after a paralytic is given because this makes the patient apneic and the patient is not breathing, the CO2 build up, the acid build up. And if you remember from nursing school, acidosis shuts down body processes. So if the patient is already very unstable and you paralyze him and all of these acids build up, the patient could arrest there. So that is why it is very important that when we are preparing, we do it correctly to prevent this worst case scenario complication from occurring. So now, as far as the equipment that we've discussed, we have a, we have suction, we have a nasal cannula, we have a non rebreather and we have ambu bags ready. You need to have your patient on a cardiac monitor connected onto the SpO2, onto the ECG, and onto the blood pressure. You need to have at least one good working IV, but if you can have two, even better. Specifically for intubation, although the RT and the provider usually gather these supplies, you should know what they are and you'll, you should know what they are. So you're going to need a laryngoscope, the blades, which are the things attached to the laryngoscope. The curved one is called the Macintosh and the straight one is called the Miller. You're also going to need a stylet, which is the blue stick that kind of goes inside the ET tube to give it sturdiness while it's inserted. And you're going to need a CO2 detector to confirm placement. It's going to be a small square device that gets attached at the end of the ET tube after intubation and it changes color from purple to yellow. Other possible equipment needed is going to be an OPA or a glidoscope, which a glidoscope is a video assisted laryngoscope. So let me uh, go quickly show you that. So it's going to be video assisted like here. Um, so that they can see what's going on. And it's useful a lot of the times um, in patients who have difficult airways, right? And it just helps everybody else so they can visualize what's, go what's going on inside the patient's body. So this is right here, a laryngoscope. And it's in the, the, laryng the laryngoscope is the thing where they hold. And then the blade is what goes inside the patient. And here, this one is the curved one. So it's the Macintosh one. What else do we have here? 
Uh, this one is kind of just an illustration of like where the ET tube uh, goes and how it gets inflated after it gets past uh, the vocal cords. And then post intubation, you're going to want to put your patient on soft restraints so that they don't wake up accidentally and then just extubate themselves. You're going to want to place your patient. Uh, you're going to want to place a Foley on your patient. You're going to want to place an NG tube to decompress the stomach and to prevent acids uh, from coming back up. You're going to want to have many pumps, of course, because your patient is going to be on a variety of drips uh, for post sedation and for analgesia and as well as other medications to treat your patient. And an important question to ask your provider before intubating when you're preparing is what medication will be used for sedation and analgesia after the intubation, right? So these can be prepared and ready once the intubation is complete. So is it gonna be propofol or is it gonna be Versed? And is it gonna be like with fentanyl and stuff like that so that that can be prepared. And then lastly, for preparing, we need to have the necessary supplies for a cricothyrotomy just in case a surgical airway needs to be placed. So what is that? Um, it's this right here. So essentially, they're trying to intubate. Everything's going wrong. It's not working. Your patient is crashing. They're going to just make a little slit right there and place the tube in there. Um, and that's a, as a backup airway management technique, a surgical management technique. So let's go back. So what medications are going to be used for intubation? You want to ask early on um, what medication, medications are going to be used, meaning which meds are going to be used for the sedation part and then which medications are going to be used for the paralyzing. We cover the medications in detail in a few more slides. Um, know that your facilities will often have special kits dedicated to RSI where the most common medications are in there so that they're easy to grab and easy to prepare, often including Atomidate, Sucks, and rocks. The main complication that worries everyone is the patient coding. So we do everything we can. We prepare to prevent that. We adequately pre-oxygenate the patient. We give push dose vasopressors and fluid resuscitation throughout for soft blood pressures. We position the patient appropriately and we closely monitor, right? We stop and we bag the patient to reoxygenate and if, if it begins to fall. And if everything fails, the patient gets a surgical airway. As we talked about, a cut is made in the throat and then the ET tube is advanced through there, right? A key thing is to keep the crash cart close by for patients who are unstable because sometimes patients just arrest despite all the preparing you did and you have to be prepared for that as well. But most importantly, it's you need to keep a watchful eye. You keep a close eye on the SPO2 communicating with the team if it's dropping so the patient can be rebagged in order to build up oxygen back up before another attempt is made. So just in case this isn't too clear, the providers will be attempting the intubation, the laryngoscope will be inside the patient, but the oxygen begins to drop you notice that you let the team know and you, you let the team know by saying, hey, the SPO2 is now 90%, 88%, so and so, so and so. The team will then stop what they're doing, take the laryngoscope out, and they will bag the patient again with the bag valve mask, right? They'll do it, they'll do it a couple of times until the oxygen levels build up again, and then they will retry to intubate the patient again. And then um, you also want to keep an eye on your provider. You're going to know if additional assistance will possibly be needed, right? So again, keep a watchful eye, communicating appropriately if the oxygen begins to drop. So if the patient needs to breathe back to rebuild the oxygen levels inside the body, and you're going to have the surgical airway equipment uh, at bedside and the crash cart readily available for patients who are extremely sick. And then the main complication that we worry about is your patient arresting, right? But if we do everything correctly, we prepare adequately and we have a watchful eye throughout the intubation, we should definitely prevent that from happening. So now let's get right into the medications, right? The one key principle is that you should always administer the sedative prior to the paralytic. Imagine just being awake, but unable to move or take a breath. 
So you sedate the patient at first, then you administer the paralytic afterwards, right? And you will usually just push them back to back, but you push the sedative, the sedative in first, the sedative in first, right? I should say that sometimes, rare uh, times, because of the times of onset, there may be times when you push the paralytic first and then quickly after push the sedative. But for the most part, 99.9% .9 of times, just remember the sedative before the paralytic. So the most common the most common sedatives that we use or induction agents are gonna be etomidate, ketamine, propofol, and versed, while the most common paralytic agents that we use are sucks and rock. And yeah, pretty much no one says the whole name out. You just say sucks or rock. So keep that in mind. So let's start off with etomidate. It's by far the most used sedative simply because it's hemodynamically stable meaning it won't affect blood pressure as much or it doesn't affect the vital signs as much as the other agents available so it tends to get used the most because a lot of the times when someone is getting intubated it's because they're sick and they're unstable it doesn't so etominate doesn't affect pain so keep in mind that you may be also administering like fentanyl for pain in patients with increased intracranial pressure so that you prevent worsening ICP from the stress and discomfort of being intubated. So the typical dose of etominate is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram with an onset of about 30 seconds and a duration of up to 10 minutes. As far as adverse effects, I've definitely seen this and it's just myoclonus, which is just jerking like movements that kind of mimic a seizure. But when I saw it, it wasn't with RSI, it was with uh, when we were cardioverting someone. So with, with RSI, you give a paralytic right afterwards, so the patient can't move either way. So even if the patient was gonna get myoclonus, you just give the paralytic, so you probably won't see it, right? But it is a complication that's, uh, not a complication, but a side effect that's possible uh, with using etomidate. So because it, etomidate is hemodynamically stable, when is it gonna be used? It's gonna be used in patients who are unstable, for example, with a soft blood pressure or patients with head injuries, as it does not lower the blood pressure or increase the blood pressure because they can, be, they can both be damaging to neural patients. Since if you lower the blood pressure in a neural patient, you can cause ischemia. And if you increase the blood pressure, you can cause worsening of ICP, right? So etominate is also useful in unstable seizure patients and patients with heart disease, as again, it does not increase or dec does not decrease or increase the blood pressure, and it's also useful in shock. It's even useful in respiratory patients because it's just a good backup. It doesn't have any bronchodilatory effects like other agents we're gonna discuss, but again, it's just an overall safe medication because it doesn't affect vital signs as these other agents. Now, let's talk about ketamine. It's a use it's very useful in respiratory issues and it does have bronchodilatory properties and it's useful as well as in shock because it increases the heart rate and the blood pressure. Another good thing about ketamine is that it does have analgesic properties. However, because it can increase the blood pressure and the heart rate, it's not used for cardiac or neuro patients since that can be damaging as we've discussed, right? With an increase in heart rate or, de uh, in our heart rate or blood pressure, I mean. The typical dose is 1.5 milligram per kilogram with an onset of approximately 60 seconds and a duration of up to 20 minutes. As discussed, it's useful in respiratory issues and in shock. However, it's not useful in patients with cardiac or neurological conditions. Another use, because patients maintain their respiratory drive with ketamine is that it can be used for awake intubations. And we're gonna discuss what an awake intubation is later on. So just keep uh, watching the video for that one. So again, ketamine uh, is really useful for respiratory issues because it has bronchodilatory properties and the patients maintain their own respiratory drive while they are sedated with ketamine. And then let's go on to the next medication. We have propofol and Versed. So thinking back, we pretty much don't use propofol Versed for intubations. Um, prop we use a lot for conscious sedations. Um, and both prop and Versed are often used or used as sedation for patients who are intubated, right? So after they get intubated, these two medications will be used as sedation. 
however they are rarely used but they can still be chosen so that's why i wanted to talk about them here propofol dosing would be 1.5 milligrams per kilogram with an onset of approximately 40 seconds and a duration of up to 10 minutes the main side effect that is it can have cardiovascular depression in other words as we've talked in other videos it can cause hypotension it's a potent anticonvulsant which is why it may be chosen for stable seizure patients but if the patient is unstable it's not going to be picked again because it lowers the blood pressure then there's Versed, which is, is an also an anticonvulsant oh battery is running low uh Versed, which is also an anticonvulsant um, and that's why it may be chosen, but it also does have those hypotensive effects, right? Um, the typical dose for Versed is 0.2 milligrams per kilogram and an onset of 60 seconds and a duration of up to 30 minutes. Propofol or Versed, uh, again, will definitely be used for post-intubation uh, sedation for the patient. All right, now let's get into some paralytics. Sucks is essentially old faithful, pretty much loved because compared to other paralytics it's quick on and quick off which as we've discussed before the longer a patient is paralyzed the likelier complications are to occur especially if something goes wrong and the intubation attempt is unsuccessful however it's not used when there is a risk of hyperkalemia and as it can cause hyperkalemia itself itself in susceptible patients so it's not going to be used in renal patients and patients who were found down with an unknown downtime as those patients are prone to getting rhabdomyolysis also not used in burn patients or crush injury patients again related to being wary of hyperkalemia another important and key reason not to use sucks is patients with a history or familial history of malignant hyperthermia as it can cause it so be wary of malignant hyperthermia because it can be deadly it's also not used in patients who we pretty much know nothing about because what if they have renal problems, which it being the ER, that can that tends to happen a lot, right? We get patients we know nothing about. So it's still all faithful because it's quick on and quick off. Again, because the longer a patient is paralyzed, the likelier it is for complications. The dosing is 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. The onset, of, the onset is approximately 45 seconds with a duration of... 10 minutes and then just to summarize not used in patients who may be at risk for hyperkalemia now let's get into rock it's pretty much used when sucks is contraindicated because it doesn't have any crazy side effects you might be thinking so why isn't rock just used instead all of the time well because it takes longer to work with an onset of around 60 seconds and it lasts forever up to one hour and again as we've discussed the longer the patient is paralyzed the likelier complications can just turn bad for example rock is given and the intubation attempt is unsuccessful and the patient starts deshiding and now the blood pressure is crappy sometimes just trying to bag the patient but it's not working and the patient ends up getting the cricothyrotomy or worse the patient arrests well of course that's like the worst possible complication but it's i'm just trying to il illustrate a point that longer someone is paralyzed the worse the outcomes can turn out but it's still definitely used at times and again the dosing is gonna be one milligram per kilogram onset of 60 seconds and in duration of around 60 minutes and again it's going to be used when sucks is contraindicated but because it does last long, you just got to make sure that you have all your backup equipment and supplies ready just in case the intubation is unsuccessful. But because you watch this video and you're a good ear nurse, you're going to have all the necessary equipment ready beforehand just in case anything goes wrong. So now let's talk about the intra procedure. So your job during the intubation is to closely monitor your patient, keeping a watchful eye on the SpO2 and communicating any changes with the team. For example, SpO2 remains 98% or SpO2 is now dropping, it's 90%, so and so. Since your provider will most likely be focused on getting the tube in the right place, you have to be the eyes and the ears, letting them know if they have to stop and rebag the patient in order to build the oxygen reserves again. As far as the procedure itself, let's keep it simple just so you understand what's going on, what they're doing, right? Um, you're going to have to keep in mind the anatomy, all this, all that. 
let the procedures worry about some of that. But to, the simple version of someone getting intubated is that they use the laryngeal scope to visualize the vocal cords. Then they advance the ET tube through the cords. The stylet, which is what provided the ET tube some structure, is removed and the patient gets and the balloon gets in, uh, inflated. They So these are the vocal cords here. And this is the ET tube getting advanced through them, right? You already saw this image earlier on, but this is, these are the vocal cords. The ET tube gets advanced through them. And then that's the main way of confirming ET tube placement. But again, this is what's happening inside the patient. Uh, a lot of the times they're just visualizing it with a laryngoscope without having the video and the providers in there just kind of seeing what's going on. But this is a good visual of what goes inside the patient. Again, here's the illustration of how it should look inside, inside with the balloon being infiltrated. And then now let's talk about post intubation. The main way to verify placement is visualizing the tube pass through the cords. However, what if they don't use the video assistive device? Of course, the provider saw it, but to double verify, a small square CO2 detector is connected. And when it detects CO2, it changes color from purple to yellow immediately, signaling that it's in the, in the right spot as CO2 is what gets excreted from the lungs, right? Besides that, you also need to auscultate both lung fields to ensure that the tube isn't too far down. Since if the tube is too far down, it's likely to go into the right bronchus or right lung. So you listen to both sides. And if you don't hear much on the left side, you communicate with the team saying, hey, uh, lung sounds are diminished on the left and they might be able to take the tube out just enough so that both lung fields or both lungs on the left and the right are getting oxygenation and are getting uh, bagged, right? Of course, you must also keep a close eye on the patient because some heavy meds were just given to the patient and you need to watch out for other complications like a pneumothorax, which definitely can happen with all the pressure of the bagging uh, and just the air being inside of them. So some nursing specific things post intubation is to get multiple lines because you're going to have sedation and analgesia going plus other medications to treat the patient for whatever they came in. Again, you're going to place the Foley and NG tube soft restraints. And if you get the chance, turn them around, put a Mepilex on them and slap a diaper on them just in case. Uh, the Foley is going to be so you can keep track of urine output and ensure that they're not retaining urine um or just peeing all over themselves which can lead to tissue breakdown the ng tube is for decompression to prevent aspiration of stomach context and eventually meds can be given through it as well soft restraints to prevent the patient from accidentally extubating themselves uh the mepilex is to prevent a pressure ulcer and a diaper kind of just to contain because natural body processes will happen right don't forget to let uh don't forget to get your patient on sedation as quickly as possible but you should have already asked prior to the intubation what medications were going to be used for sedation. So they should already be ready to go, right? Because you're proactive and not reactive. And then ultimately just carry out the treatment and monitor your patient closely for anything and um, communicate with the team if you notice anything's not going right. Now, let's talk about other types of, of intubation, mainly awake intubation. So when a difficult intubation is expected whether it's because of the patient's anatomy or from how unstable they are the provider will administer a sedative which is most likely going to be ketamine as the patient gets sedated but maintains their respiratory drive they'll administer ketamine in order to go and attempt to visualize the vocal cords with the laryngoscope Right. And then at that point, the provider is able to see and choose if the patient should be intubated and if they're able to intubate or if not, they can choose to stop and abort there and no harm, no foul because the patient's respiratory drive was kept throughout minimizing the risk because ketamine has that ability, right? With the rest, keeping the respiratory drive. So if the, the medication is given, the provider goes in, tries to visualize the cords, but can't do it. So they choose to abort and they can now come up with a different game plan without putting the patient at such a high risk of giving the paralytic, then going apneic, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's another option that providers can sometimes use. So now let's get into the question of the day. What are the reversal agents for warfarin? Again, what are the reversal agents for warfarin? Let's say your patient has a massive head bleed and they're on warfarin. How do you reverse warfarin? Ooh, let's go back. 
So now, if anything comes to mind of stuff that you want to learn, please comment below. Also below in the description, I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books. You should be learning as much as possible, especially while you're precepting. I recommend reading outside of work, whether it's one of my favorite books, including Sheehy's Manual of Emergency Care or Emergency Medicine Cases that I've listed below, or one that gets recommended to you by someone else. Being a good ER nurse depends a lot on your experiences and on taking the time to look up and familiarize yourself with topics that you don't fully understand. So always keep learning, always keep learning, especially while you're precepting. And if you additionally want to support the channel, I have some stickers on Redbubble. Check them out. If not, it's cool too. I just hope you learned something today. And then as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.